Is the mic on? We're here a lot. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, you guys, I'm really shy now. I feel really shy. Okay, this is John. This is my beloved partner. And I want to talk a little bit before he and I start talking together about our three principles that we want to share with, um, for relationships of all kinds and for your relationship with yourself. But I want to focus just for a moment on romantic relationship because, um, and I want to introduce a concept that I'm writing about right now, which is called soulmates, but it's not spelled the way you usually see it. It's spelled S-O-L-E-M-A-T-E-S, -E -E soulmates. Because I was happily and cons marvelously single for many years and self-loving. I married myself in 1997 and promised to never leave me. And it was a mystery to me how to integrate another person into that. And in fact, I didn't believe it was possible at all. I was one of the people, I feel like I'm one of the people now that I used to, I said years ago, I'll never be one of those cat people. And then I got Jupiter and I became a cat person. And then I've said, I'll never be one of those couples that talks ooey gooey about some romantic thing. And now I've become that person. So, <laughs> but I want to share with you, I have this wonderful joy container and, it, and it's this magical box and it says, happy, happy joy. And I didn't tell anyone this, but inside this box, which I'm going to open right now, there's another box inside the box, which is called top secret. And in, it says no peeking, but we're going to peek. <laughs> and it has a little yellow piece of paper folded up. And I'm going to open it, and it says on it, someone to, love and a, someone to love and adore who also loves and adores me. And here's the little paper. And this was inside this box. I wrote it maybe eight months ago. And in uh, the summer of last year, I was on a cruise, uh, an Abraham cruise. If you don't know Abraham, Abraham Hicks, abraham-hicks.com, Law of Attraction. Um, I really enjoy their work and I was on a cruise and I met John and <laughs> within a month of meeting each other we were living together which we are here in San Francisco I have never lived full-time with a partner or a lover so I want you to understand how major this is and how the practices and processes that he and I do together that's why we want to share them and teach them because I'm telling you I'm telling you they work because he would never be in this house <laughs> <laughs> and so um, so John um, shall we share about the three principles of uh, or talk about talk about to tell people who you are tell okay. tell tell it. about tell yes. about you <laughs> for, ma for many years um, I was a practicing psychologist um, I've always been interested in metaphysics. Uh, I started out exploring different religions and so on. Uh, many years ago, I, I discovered the Seth material. I really, it, it just hit home for me in many ways. Um, and then in, in 2002, uh, I, I met a woman who actually led up to my being with Susan um, and who I married, uh, who uh, introduced me to the Abraham Hicks material. and. Uh, I love the concept of the law of attraction. Um, I apply it everywhere. Uh, I uh, use it to understand events around me. It's been wonderful for me. Um, and one of the things that um, I learned in the marriage that I had before I met Susan, and my wife transitioned uh, uh, in 2011, um, uh, was probably the most uh, painful experience I've ever had in my life. Uh, our honeymoon was never over, and that's one of the things I, I said to Susan. And one of the things, by the way, that I really appreciate is that uh, Susan uh, accepts my past, accepts the relationships that I've had, just as I accept Susan's past. And um, anyway, one of the things that I learned that uh, Jeannie taught me and t together is that we could actually uh, be together in such a way that uh, we can always find solutions that bring joy to both of us. Uh, most of us have learned uh, that you know re relationships are compromise, and so this I think is one of the things that uh, opened Susan to me, is that, is when I s presented that as a possibility. 
Well, and I want to share that one of the really big openings was walking on the deck of the cruise ship and uh, many things occurred in our meeting, but he said to me, you know, I was married for 10 years, the honeymoon never ended. He said, I want you to know that I'm qualified to adore you. And I was like, oh, all right. And then I thought, how? And uh, I had always been someone who thought that I had to change my partner to be happy. If only they would do dot, dot, dot. And I had a list. I had a list with every other person. This is the first time that I'm listless and not in the way that, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't have a list. And when he, when you introduced this concept to me that I could live without compromise, a friend said to me, well, I know it's been a lot to have him move into your space that you lived in alone for 15 years, so I know you've given a lot of stuff up. I'm sure you've given a lot of stuff up. And I said, I've given nothing up. I said, he's introduced me to this concept of no compromise and that we would find joyful solutions that are different than either of us would have thought of on our own. Uh, perhaps that we, you know, that I'm not giving up a little bit and kind of begrudging and then going and making a list. It's just not like that. Well, yeah. So let's, uh, I'm thinking of the, one of the first things that happened is um, uh, I had a convertible. I, I moved here from Columbus, Ohio. And um, I, by the way, just a little background. I, uh, when I was in college, I lived in San Francisco. I loved the city. And so I was able to come here uh, with the understanding that if things worked out with us, that would be wonderful, and if it didn't, that would be fine. Uh, and that was that was also you. you felt and that's that. how I'm going. It's an open yeah. door. Either exactly. of us could say this is not working. Um, I don't see that happening, but it's there's it's not an entrapment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very important. So anyway, so but well, I I had a convertible. I love convertibles. I love that open air feeling. And um, so when we came here, uh, it, it, parking is horrific in San Francisco. Um, I'm used to just pulling into a place in Columbus, you know, but here it's like you sometimes you're hunting around for a while. Uh, so we didn't really want two cars. We didn't need two cars in the city. So we're going back and forth. I really wanted a convertible. Susan liked uh, her Mini. And uh, so, you know, what to do, what to do. And uh, so one of the things that, that uh, one of the uh, ideas behind being able to find solutions that don't, don't involve compromise is being able to expand and go back and to look at the larger picture. What is it you really want? And for me, it was that open air feeling. Um, and so what, I, what we ended up with is to get a scooter. And so now we have the Mini, and so we go on with that. And, and I just love having the scooter. And if I had just stuck, you know, if we rigidly stuck with convertible, no convertible, con we would have just gotten tense. Um, and w one of the ways that uh, allows one to have these kind of solutions is to be aware that um, y you also want to help the other person get what they want. Uh, so often people get locked into what they want themselves and then they miss the, the other picture. And if the other person feels, and this has to be genuine of course, if they feel that, uh, that you really want uh, them to have what they want too. And this is what we both felt with each other. And by the way, it's easier when two people understand this idea. And Susan, of course, went right with it. Uh, but there are lots of situations uh, where uh, the other person may be more rigid and may not understand this whole concept and feel uh, they just want what they want. You can still apply this because as long as you are in a space where you can picture the, the whole idea, the possibility, of finding a solution that works for everyone. And, and you genuinely are working to help them get what they need, and uh, the essence of what they need, not the specifics. Uh, you know, m the essence for me, uh, uh, the specifics was, I didn't really want to, uh, to end up with a, uh, a non-convertible and, and to lose the, the experience that I had. But I also wanted Susan to have the essence of what she wanted. And she did for me too. And she was excited about getting the scooter. And so that was a, you know, a simple early example. Uh, and of course, my moving in, the, if you've ever moved or you've moved in with someone, there are hundreds of decisions. And so often, uh, well, it was easy, of course, many of them were easy, but, uh, but lots of them involved, uh, you know, really stopping and talking. And, and it was that sense that we both care for each other, we both want the other to have what they want, um, that really made it work. That is so, John, would you tell people just a snapshot on what you feel the law of attraction is? 
because I know some oh, people have okay. a real understanding and some people think it's wonderful. just the secret. Wonderful, or, yes. wonderful. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. Just, just, uh, you know, when I first heard about it, the idea of like and to like attracts, uh, I thought, who cares? What does that mean? The Hindus had been studying this for years and years. And Abraham Hicks, uh, the, the seminar where, where Susan and I met, uh, they, they have done the most magnificent job of really elucidating uh, how the law of attraction impacts our lives every day. And on the simplest level, uh, if you feel good, you're going to attract other things that feel good. If you don't feel good, you'll attract other things that don't. So the most basic principle is there's nothing more important than feeling good. And uh, for most of us, you know, uh, we're actually uh, are not taught that. You know, when, when we, uh, uh, as kids, uh, w when it's time to go to school, our parents don't say, would you enjoy going to school? They say, no, we don't care how you feel, you have to go to school. And we learn early on not to pay attention to our feelings because they're uh, considered irrelevant by the authority figures, the people that are going to, quote, help us get ahead in life. And then when we're adults and we go into therapy and so on and so forth, and we realize, hey, our feelings are important. And I want to interject about, um, because we don't feel good all the time. There is nothing more important than we feel good, but we don't feel good all the time. So the law of attraction isn't saying that you always have to feel good. It's That's the preponderance. A... It's the preponderance of your feelings. Uh, even if you, uh, the majority of the people in our culture actually do not feel good most of the time. If you can even feel good half the time, uh, or, or two-thirds of the time, you're, you're way ahead. Uh, plus, it, it, we are also living in a, in a benevolent, loving universe. And this is something, uh, the, the secret uh, was very popular in our culture. And, uh, and they did an, a wonderful job of explaining how the law of attraction can bring things into our lives. But the secret didn't really address the larger uh, context in which we all live, which is that, uh, that uh, we are... Uh, we tend to think of our physical reality as the ultimate and only reality. It's like uh, a couple of hundred years ago, people believed that life on Earth was the only possible life and we were the center of the universe. And we understand now that the universe has billions of stars and the, and the chances of <coughs> other life not being there is, is, is ridiculous. Uh, so, likewise, we think of our physical reality as being the only and prime reality. But there's so much information that can come to us. Uh, Susan calls it our inner wise self. Uh, there's channeled material. There's uh, uh, so many traditions that have connected with the non-physical. And if we understand that larger picture, and we understand that the non-physical is is acting is is basically love, and is basically supportive, and that we are just a small part of that. Uh, and the whole purpose of our lives is to be in joy. The, Oh, stop here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so good. I want, I want, and the, if people have questions, they should uh, type them in. But before oh. I take that, Edward, I just want to say we're going to, you know, there's three principles so, that we want people yes. to be able to use in their romantic relationships, in their relationships with themselves and with other people. And so one of them we've talked about is um, no compromise and finding joyful solutions. We'll come back and, and uh, talk, we'll talk further about the other two. So I, I don't want to okay. lose sight of the three that absolutely, we promised. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, and let me underscore something that Susan said again. It's all relationships. It's not just romantic relationships. Yes, yes. So Edward, question. People are interested in, um, so what do, Joanne Sanchez asked, so what do I do when my little boy says I don't want to go to school? Well, in our culture, that is not an easy question uh, because, you know, uh, we are by law uh, required to send our kids to school. Uh, if we think of it in the larger picture, what is our laws? We tend to think of them as absolute. Our laws is basically a bunch of guys who got elected who decided what would be best. Um, however, uh, looking at it in a specific incident, as you're saying, how do I deal with my son? The first question I would ask him is, why not? What is it about school that you don't enjoy? And then go from there, what is it about school that you do enjoy? And I think a lot of times uh, what you end up with is some specific. And again, that's looking at the larger picture. He's only able at that moment to say, I don't want to go to school, but probably something happened there, or probably something else is going on. And if you can see uh, what, what the essence of his... Uh, uh, rejection is or his, his fears or whatever, then you can actually help him process that. Um, there are some uh, rare cases uh, 
where kids are too bright to be in school in some ways. Uh, I know uh, uh, my wife's, uh, one of my wife's sons, uh, he uh, dropped out of uh, school uh, and ended up teaching at a college. You know, he never graduated. He was too smart. Uh, there are other reasons that everyone does not fit in school. We just assume that everyone should be in school. And it's again, if you look at the larger picture, there are also uh, homeschooling and so on. I'm not recommending to take kids out of school. What I'm, what I'm recommending is to, to allow yourself to see the larger picture and, not, uh, and see if you can hold back for a moment from saying you must go to school. That's the only solution possible here. Do you see that? And likewise, asking him to, to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it is specifically that is uncomfortable. Yes, that, thank, that was wonderful. Yes, Edward. Laura wants to know, how can I unlearn learned unhappiness? Mm. Do you want to take no, it? No, you. Well, um, you, you can't really unlearn anything because all experience is with, is with us all the time. All the frequencies are with us all the time. Uh, what you can do is you can begin to focus on new things. You can begin to consciously focus on things that you love. Uh, you know, it's so tempting. You know, we, uh, 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 I almost never watch news on TV, for example, anymore because there's a constant stream. Uh, it, w when we were uh, in, living in small villages and there was a fire, it was very important that everyone respond to the fire and we rush out and we put the fire out because that's who we were. And what the news folks have learned is that uh, people will respond more to crises things. So there's actually uh, a syndrome developed in our culture uh, called, uh, what is it? Uh, I've forgotten the exact name of it now, but it's uh, uh, some, it, it, what it comes from, it'll come back to me in a second. Uh, what it comes from is you'll turn on the news and some major event will happen that will fight. Oh, mean world syndrome. That's the name of it. People who will, li will live in very uh, comfortable surroundings in the suburbs will be, will be locking their doors because they will see so many things on television that frighten them. Things that happen five states away or things that happen across the world because the news people know if they can bring that negativity to you, then uh, you will respond. And you, you know, people will get locked in. So it's a, it's a conscious decision to turn off those streams that remind you of the negativity. Step out of your house and walk down. If you live in a comfortable neighborhood, walk around rather than watching this some scary thing that's on TV. So uh, that's a simple example. But the basic principle is to focus on things that please you. And the more you focus on things that please you, the more things that please you will come into your experience. Yeah, and I want to add, thank you, and I want to add to that, that when you don't, I'm going to take us back again to the inner wise self and to, your, to part one of three-part harmony or any other process by which you can express your feelings. Because, you know, you're, you will encounter, you know, we see things that upset us, but then if we don't have a, any kind of feelings care system, as I said, it will just swirl around in your head, and that's what you'll be watching. That'll be your channel. It'll be a channel that you're not turning off inside your own head. So that's a beautiful question, and again, of service to everyone um, listening. And, you know, you and I have, you know, because it, it would be very tempting to think that, you know, we're wearing these purple things and we're glowing, and, you know, here we are. We have our time of not feeling good, and we witness each other in times of just, you know, disharmony or upset or resistance or it's usually him, but, you know, I, I, I feel it's important to, you know, kind of be fair. Um. <laughs> Well, one, 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 of the, uh, one of the things that I like, the, the things, uh, I, uh, one of the things people say about top athletes, what distinguishes a top athlete from an average athlete is the recovery. Every athlete will, uh, you know, throw the ball uh, where it isn't supposed to go or miss a catch or something like that. But uh, the, the elite athletes have the ability to, to recover and not start blaming themselves or other people on the team, but keep their eye on the ball, so to speak, literally, to focus. And, and that really is the key for our relationship, I think, is sure, we, we get off balance. We have methods to get back in balance. We remind ourselves that we love ourselves, that we love each other. We have a dog at the bottom of our... That Belle's <laughs> taking the feelings doll over to the sun. 
<laughs> now she's bringing it to me. Oh, she's showing me. She's got the feelings doll. So she's reminding you about your feelings and the importance right. of your feelings. Do we have uh, any uh, more questions, Edward? We Edward? do, but there are the two principles. Do you want to do this first? Yes, yes. Let's go to the second. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, the second one uh, yeah. is uh, your partner is perfect for you. Now, I want to interrupt and say, okay. I thought this was really exciting. I thought, you know, he said, you are perfect, and any way that you're not is my responsibility. And I thought, that's awesome. Why haven't I found this guy before? And then all of a sudden, it started sinking in, wait a minute, he's perfect, and any way that he's not is my responsibility. That sounds hard. It did, you know, and it occasionally is. Yes. Because and we both find ways where we try to blame the other, and then the other says, "Yeah, sounds like you're blaming," you know, and you know, it's like, damn. In terms of looking at the world, in terms of the law of attraction, uh, you're basically always creating your reality, and the ultimate expression of that is understanding that everything that comes into your experience, especially the way you experience it, is based on the constant vibrations that you're sending out. And that's through your thoughts, your beliefs, your emotions. Um, and so uh, it's very difficult if one looks at the world from that perspective uh, to blame anybody else for anything, um, and especially in a relationship. So that's on that uh, sort of metaphysical level. And on the practical level, it's much easier to change ourselves than to change someone else. And so if, if one approaches a relationship in terms, and this, has, this is not just a couple relationship, again, it's any relationship, your boss, your friends, uh, your kids, um, with the idea of how can I find a solution here that I can feel good uh, and without having, without having to change what the other person does. Oh, so this is, you know, you heard me say about lists. So one of the places I get really uh, sometimes anxious is when someone else is driving the car because I'm very independent and I consider myself a good driver and I consider others not as good of a driver. And especially when it's uh, the other person that I'm in relationship with. Tell the story about the stop signs. Oh, so when John <laughs> first moved here from Columbus, he would come up to each intersection and he would suddenly start going like this, like looking for the stop sign. And I was like... Because they were behind trees off. And yeah, like, yeah, they were off to the side. I was like, why is this guy, you know, can he drive? You know, this is this seems alarming. <laughs> and and then we discovered that I finally said to him, John, do you realize that, that the word stop is written in the street at each intersection? And he said, oh, no, it's not like that in Columbus. I didn't <laughs> know that. And I said, wow. I said, well, that solves that, you know, but... But the part that I really want to, sh the other part that I really want to share is I started getting very controlling. Like John would be, he was doing something with the, the side mirror and I was like, I don't think you should be doing that now. And he said, it's all right, I'm just fixing it. And I said, no, no, not while you're driving. And then he sure enough started kind of going, weaving a little bit and another car came close. And I had this whole, I was starting a list of, you know, if only John would drive differently, I would feel safe and happy in the car. And it really seemed true. It seemed clear to me that if you would just drive differently, I would be feeling better. And this is how I approached all my past relationships with my brother, with other co-workers, with, with anyone. And, you know, you did you invent the concept of the cab driver? Was that no, that you? was yours. Oh, that was mine. Yeah. And that was my way to... So will you speak more about that? Because we, we healed this now. Well, first of all, John said, you know, some of you may have done this before, the one who drives decides. So they decide the music, they decide the route, and but what does the other person do? You know, if you're if you're just agreeing to that, but you're secretly, you know, over there driving, you know, yeah, fine, the one who drives decides, but I will tell you where to turn left. You know, so we came, I came up with this concept where John is my is the cab driver, because it it is true that I also have told cab drivers how to drive, <laughs> <laughs> but less often than. You know, and, and lo and behold, John wasn't not seeing the stop signs anymore. John wasn't adjusting mirrors and weaving. I haven't had any problem with his driving since we came up with this creative solution. And we have thousands of examples of creative solutions that we've come up with together yeah. that make the relationship really harmonious. And, and it's really expanded into the rest of my life, too, because um, I brought that principle of the other person is perfect. My neighbor is perfect. 
Um, for you. For me. And, and whatever ways I'm not finding it perfect are mine to explore and transform. And so that's the second. So the first principle is no compromise. Um, no, uh, finding a joyful solution. Finding a joyful solution, so no compromise. You can compromise. find a solution, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the it, second one is, is your partner is perfect. Your partner is perfect. And, and, and but, but let me just uh, add a couple of things. Uh, when I was driving, I could adjust the mirror uh, and drive safely. What I couldn't do is adjust the mirror, drive safely, and listen to Susan. <laughs> 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 and so I mentioned that, and that's that prompted Susan to, to shift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and that brings us to the next one, yeah, which is uh, third. appreciate your boundaries. And know your boundaries. Yeah know, the, yeah, know your boundaries, right. Know your boundaries or appreciate either one. Uh, yeah, know your boundaries. And, and, and uh, that was part of what Susan was saying. Will you define oh. that, though? Because a lot of people yeah, don't yeah, know yeah. about their boundaries. Uh, well, I was going to give an example. Uh, uh, when you realize, okay, um, if Susan is driving, it's Susan driving. It's not me driving. And to understand, my boundary ends at me. And the same thing, when I'm driving, I'm driving. And, and uh, uh, you know, Susan will often, I'm new to San Francisco, and so I often rub a neck a little bit as I'm looking around. Uh, but, uh, and I do appreciate when Susan uh, says, oh, uh, the next turn is the one you want to take, or Are you, I think you're about to pass something, or something like that. And I, I do appreciate that. And, and uh, uh, there's a difference, though, between welcoming someone into your boundaries and someone pushing into your boundaries. And so when I was adjusting the mirror, I wasn't welcoming uh, criticism, <laughs> you know. So, so part of understanding your boundaries and the other person's boundaries, it's, it's, uh, some people phrase it differently, they just say, mind your own business, because it's so tempting. Uh, and, a, and a good uh, example is, ask yourself, would I treat a friend the way I'm now treating my partner? And often we're much more respectful with our friends than we are with our lovers. Because the assumption is, well, you know, uh, now they're part of me, and so, you know, this is my wife, you know, this is my husband, it's like ownership, this is my dog, so then we, uh, my child, you know, and so uh, culturally uh, we're taught, to, you know, that we're responsible, we're certainly uh, taught we're responsible for our kids. And uh, we often also feel uh, embarrassed um, when uh, someone in our family does something, uh, uh, and so it's, it's, um, it is really important to have, if you want to have a happy relationship, to be able to know where your boundaries are and where the other person's are and not to push yourself into their boundaries and to be aware when they're pushing into yours and to be able to say no. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And I just realized I didn't describe uh, what I meant by soulmates. I just spelled it and then I stopped talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's what I'm calling the best of being single and self-loving in a relationship with another. So that's my new concept now of, of, of soulmate. And so I just wanted to mention um, John and I are going to be speaking more about this. And, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot I want to share that I'm learning. I haven't shared well um, in my past. I've been very independent and kind of... Uh, bossy is a word that comes to mind um, I'm also marvelous and wonderful and all of those things I, I'm, I'm just saying that I wasn't really welcoming another person I didn't know like John t teased in the beginning he said you because all of a sudden here was this guy I'm like how'd you get in here you know like he's going to the bathroom and eating food and uh, and John said you didn't really think this through did you <laughs> You know, and I was like, well, yeah, it seems kind of real. There's a lot of reality to this, you know, like suddenly you're sharing your space. I live in a, a fairly small space and we live now in a fairly small space that yet nothing has been a, you know, a real problem. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible, really. It's It's actually a miracle. That's why I named this Miraculous Relationships, because I wanted to talk about the miracle. Do we have, uh, in case you have questions, some, we do? Questions. Okay, great. Um, Joanne would like to know, a question for Sark, how did you first feel about opening to your partner when you met? Did you have to battle any old feelings? Oh, that's great. What a great question. Well, you know, it's funny, because when I went on the cruise, I had no intentions of meeting a person, uh, a romantic or otherwise. I was with my friend Edward, who you've met, and our friend Philip, 
And that was really enough for me. And then Philip came uh, to invite us to lunch and said, well, you know, Susan, I know sometimes you'd like to know who's coming to lunch or energetically. I'd like to invite a couple of people to lunch. Do you think that's okay? And I said, oh, Philip, let's, it's time to be done with all that. I said, I'm open to anything. And I went like this. Oh, but before I say more, I just want to say that I explored over the last couple of years a lot about, uh, I, I started, I joined something called the Conscious Singles Wisdom Circle. Um, I did uh, Calling in the One, a course about your soulmate. Um, I explored a lot. I talked with Edward about a show called The Millionaire Matchmaker, and she has you do five non-negotiables of what, so we worked over a year about what are my non-negotiables to have in a relationship. So I had been in some ways preparing the way without knowing that I was preparing the way, which I think is probably pretty good because otherwise if I'd known, I probably would have resisted it. My, my first response is often resistance. So um, that's just a little background, but back on the ship now, when I was about to go to the lunch, um, I just was open to anything, as I had said. And in pops John. And, you know, initially he seemed like my mother would call, my mother would have called John a really neat guy. She would have said, what a neat guy. And that's how kind of how I felt, like, what a neat guy. Wow. But initially I thought he was partners with the woman he was sitting by. And it turns out he'd popped in between a married couple so he could sit closer to me. <laughs> and, and one of my prayers, Joanne, had been, I want a man who will pursue me, who will claim me, who will find me, who will know me. I, I'm done initiating. I want to receive. I want to be the receptive feminine which doesn't mean that I'm not an initiator. It doesn't mean I'm not strong. It just means I want to experience that. And uh, so there, there have been old things that rose up, but I think I did a lot of business with those old things. But what, uh, let what me, do you uh, want to say? Oh, uh, I, wanted, I sat between the couple because Susan was at, far, at the far end of the table. Uh, I did not know who she was. Uh, uh, I didn't know anything about Sark at the time. Uh, they, she was just an attractive woman to me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I wanted to get to know her. That was uh, yeah. And so one of the we had the lunch, and then one of the first things we did was play the transformation game, which is a game about the way you play your life. And Edward and John and I played the game, and I saw almost everything I needed to know from that game. I also want to mention that John, as well as being a metaphysical teacher, is an author. And he has two incredible books, and um, John and Jeannie Fly. It's Living the Law of Attraction, and it's about two people. It's a metaphysical novel about two people who discover they know how to fly. And I wanted to know if the book was any good, because I thought, <laughs> if this guy can't write, you know, what am I going to do? I mean, I don't mean it that harshly, but I, I wanted to know. I, I was very curious. A lot curious. of me is in the book. I knew that. Yeah. yeah. And so he loaned me the book, and I ran back to my stateroom to start reading it. And the first paragraph, I knew it was good. And the first chapter, I knew it was great. And then I went on, and I'm actually, we're, you're reading, he's reading it out loud to me now because I've been saying that I'm in the first season of John because <laughs> we're so um, in love and spending so much time together. It's like, like watching a fabulous TV series. So it's the first season of John, and I, he's with me, so I don't feel the need to read about him. You know? So we've been joking because he hasn't read Sark books hardly at all. And he didn't only even... when Susan isn't around, only right. when, you, when you're not around. Right. It's so, but it's so sweet. But I never, I did never imagine this for myself, um, and consciously, you know. I mean, I wouldn't have ever guessed I would be living with a partner in San Francisco and so happy. Yeah, I, I think I think what you had pictured was the essence of what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And the other part you didn't think through. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, I've spent a lot of time alone and more time than most people, you know, like alone, 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 you know, all everything my way, everything, you know. Uh, I, I got, did you have more questions? Or you, we do. Okay. okay. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. A question from Susan, but not the Susan who's there. Um, <laughs> how do you bring these principles into an already existing long relationship? Where do you start first? Smart. Yeah, well, uh, this is... Um, Part of it is to, to understand your priorities. 
often there are little things that bug us about our partners. And in the best of relationships, they become endearing after a period of time. Uh, so let's just take a simple example. Um, uh, uh, your, your, uh, Susan, your husband or partner or whatever, leaves uh, his dirty clothes in the bedroom, okay? And, uh, and it bugs you. And I could understand why. Um, and so you might say to him, hey, honey, please don't do it, but he continues to do it. So the one way to approach this is to ask yourself, what if he were gone? Uh, what if he were gone and the clothes were gone? H how, how would you feel? Would you suddenly get some perspective and go, my God, you know, I'd rather have him around even with the clothes. Or in the worst case or another case, you might say, you know, that isn't so bad. <laughs> and so, so when you ask yourself that question and, and you, you get a feeling answer, then you can go from there. So if you decide, you know, uh, I really, w I, I'll take the clothes any day if it would mean his being out of my life because I really value him. That puts things into perspective. Um, the other thing is most likely, uh, and uh, our partners send out certain messages to us all the time. And so the message that he's been sending out to you is I leave my clothes around, I leave my stuff around probably. And, and it's very easy to, to uh, be hypnotized, so to speak, by those messages. And so one of the things that you can do is to begin to notice all the times when your partner is doing things the way you would like him to do it. Uh, maybe it's only once a day, you know. But if you begin to focus, remember, anything we focus on gets amplified. So if you begin to focus on that aspect of him, uh, what you might uh, find is that all of a sudden things begin to suddenly change. The first thing you'll notice is your feelings will change because when you're focusing on the things that you love about him instead of the things that bug you, um, then your feelings towards him are going to change right away. And from that, and, and he will experience that shift in your feelings. Uh, when I said that the honeymoon was never over, and I don't expect the honeymoon to be over with Susan and me either, <laughs> you know, to me, the honeymoon is over when you look at your partner and you go, if they would only change, I could feel better. Because during the honeymoon, you're going, every time you see your, your lover, you're going, oh, I am so happy to see you. And so the idea is to get back to the place where you can look at your partner with love. And that it can involve a certain um, focus. It requires a certain focus because you can always find something negative. It, it, I was taught, you know, we were all taught the whole idea, uh, if there's a dirty spot on the kitchen floor, uh, uh, get on it. Make sure you notice it, make sure you clean it up. That works very well in so many areas of our lives, but it doesn't work well with people. Uh, because when we see something, uh, it's not about cleaning up another person. And that's where the whole idea of understanding your boundaries comes from. So, uh, Susan has talked uh, a lot and makes sense about you can have many feelings at the same time. And, and uh, I, I, I'm going to approach this from a slightly different angle. And that is, it's very important uh, to let your feelings flow, the way Susan Sark has suggested. At the same time, we basically are usually in either love or fear. And if we're in, in we can't be in both. And it takes a certain amount of, of uh, focus, conscious focus, to stay in love with our partners and to see the perfection in our partners. And as we, do, as we make that effort, that does become amplified. I, I assure you of that. Not only in terms of your own feelings. Uh, I, I'll give you an example uh, of real life experience. Uh, uh, is this, uh, where this was with Jeannie, my wife, and I. We had a good friend who swore all the time. And Jeannie was very uncomfortable with people swearing. I can take it or leave it, you know. But she was very uncomfortable with it. And so she never said anything to him about it but just focused on the fact that she wanted uh, to have a different experience. And we noticed after a couple of months, he didn't swear around us at all. And it was amazing because nothing was ever said. So that's, that's yeah. just one simple example. No, I love that example. Yeah. What a wonderful question. Yeah. Do we have more questions? We're, we're gonna, sure. We've got some more time. Um, from a Jody, can we hear some wisdom on making decisions from our hearts, our heart centers, versus following someone else's star. Mm. Don't know. Well, uh, our hearts are never... In any, any time you're around anyone else, uh, there's going to be an interactional influence. Uh, it, on the simplest levels I talked before about the idea of you watch, if you watch uh, the news on TV, that's going to impact you. Someone close in your life is going to impact you. 
And so you're, uh, the way I'm hearing your question is, how do I stay true to my inner guidance as opposed to being moved uh, 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 uncomfortably by someone else? Uh, especially for women in our culture, we're taught to be uh, uh, caretakers. Okay, so women are supposed to be caretakers. We, we, it's very important or very useful biologically and, and in our society for women to take care of children, for example. Um, and so there's a natural inclination to, uh, to respond to another person. And uh, I think it's more, uh, it takes a little bit more focus for a woman to stay true to herself because of that cultural uh, pressure. Yeah, yes. Uh, but if, again, it, it, it comes back to knowing your boundaries and appreciating your boundaries. My life is my own. Uh, one of the things I'm clear about with Susan, her career is her own. My career is my own. Uh, she doesn't have to uh, uh, do anything in order for me to be okay. Uh, uh, if, if, if one of the early agreements uh, 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 that we came to was, uh, well, let me go back. One of the first things, uh, uh, one of the things that was going through my mind before I even approached the possibility of being with Susan, making a play for her, uh, was the I understanding I could, if I ever tried to hold her back, um, that would not only uh, mess up our relationship, but it could mess up uh, what Susan was doing, which I really had started to love and value, Susan's creativity. I mean, it's amazing, as I'm sure you know even better than I do. Um, and so uh, I'm very clear about that. I, I make every effort not to block Susan, and I feel the same from her with me. And it, it's wonderful when one has that understanding. And it's always, uh, generally, it, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a feeling of I have to either go along with someone or there's pressure from the other person uh, to uh, uh, basically saying to you, in order for me to be happy, you have to change. And when you can identify that, you can even say to that person, is there a way for you to have what you want without pulling on me to be different? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Edward, was there another? Um, from Jean, um, for Susan or both of you, uh, about how does this work in non-primary, non-romantic relationships? Like yeah, we were just talking about this whole concept of no compromise, even in the realm of politics. Like, wow, what would it be like if people were finding joyful solutions? Um, you know, uh, friendships. So do you want to speak about friendships? How well, the, the friendship? same principles apply. And uh, I think that uh, we had an incident with a fun incident with Belle uh, where she hadn't had a chance to, to be on a walk for a few days and uh, Edward couldn't walk her. And uh, so Susan and I were walking her and we, we'd gone, she'd led us down the hill a little bit and then we were thinking, yeah, you down know, a big hill. Down a big hill. We think it's time to go back. And, and Belle just stared at us, <laughs> like seriously saying, I have not had enough of a walk. And so we. And she were, wouldn't move. Yeah, she wouldn't move. And so I, we were talking about, you know, no compromise relationships. And here was this dog. And, uh, uh, and, and I realized, you know, uh, let's stick with our principles. Yeah. You know, can we find a solution here where, where we feel good and where Belle feels good? And so we just went with it instead of trying to force Belle back up the hill. So we said, okay, what the heck? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're just reminding me of uh, with a child, with uh, my godchild Jonah. We were all going out to dinner. Right. He's nine. And the same principle applied because he said, where are we going to go? And I said, we're going to go somewhere that everyone wants to. And you just saw the look over his face like kids don't get to vote, you know, like kids are taken. And yeah, maybe there's times where you, you know, of course, there's times where you need to go somewhere for, for some reason. But if you if you practice this principle skillfully, we, which we did that night, we, we chose a place. We didn't really consult with him. And he came over to me and said, um, I don't feel good there, Susan. And I said, why? And he said, I don't know. The lights are red and it's strange. And I was like, okay, we won't go there. And I told John and he went and took our name off the list. And Jonah said, where are we going to go now? I said, somewhere where everyone feels good. And we found this great place and he had a margarita pizza and everyone was communing with each other. And it was, it, we were in a living example of finding joyful solutions that work for everyone. Wasn't that a wonderful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when we had a wonderful walk with Belle, and then we we came to a set of stairs going back up the hill, and I said, "I'm really ready to go back now." And Elle, Belle just wandered up the steps, no problem, she, no yeah. pulling. She ran. Yeah. yeah. It was, so yeah. Yeah. 
So are we getting, are we at time or we have five, we can ask, answer another question? Do we have um, another? We have another question. Um, we don't have another question at this moment. Okay. People are very excited though about the idea of applying these to friends and to living. Absolutely. That's with everyone. With everyone. Remember, um, every, every person in your experience is a symbol for you. And that's another aspect of, of, of understanding your partner in, in a relationship. We all, we, we all of us have family, familiarity. We have certain symbols that are meaningful to us that mean that we're being loved. And it, it, uh, this is why uh, relationships with people who come from the same subcultures uh, generally work out better because they understand the symbols. And so, but even in that case, in all cases, it's useful to be able to explain to your partner uh, if, if you're not feeling loved, uh, what kind of symbols would make you feel loved, you know, would enhance those feelings. Yes, Edward. Um, a couple people would like you just to repeat the principles. Okay. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so there are three of them. Uh, you can always find joyful solutions, which is no compromise. Uh, know your boundaries, appreciate your boundaries. And the third one is your partner is perfect for you. Or any other person is perfect for or you. Or any other person. You know, so so yes. every one of these is applied to, you know, joyful solutions is to your neighbor, your brother, your sister, your coworker. You know, right. the knowing your boundaries applies to your neighbor, your coworker. I mean, but again, applies can be applied uh, to everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, and, and I got a little bit off track there when I was saying that everyone is a symbol in your life. And if for you to be happy, you, all your symbols have to be positive for you. And that doesn't mean people have to change. That means uh, either ignoring the negative symbols. You know, I mean, there's a lot, like I say, turn off the news. Uh, many times you can simply ignore the negative symbols, but if they keep coming up for you, then it's important to shift your focus about them and your attitude about them. And that, and you have, you always have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just have to say, you are so wonderful. Maybe one more question. Oh, okay. Uh, um, uh, one uh, is how about from Molly? How about a suggestion for applying no compromise in a work environment with coworkers or a boss? Ah, yeah. I would, I would begin by asking yourself, what is it that they want, as well as what do I want? And then I would approach them with the attitude of, um, how can I help you get what you want? Yeah. So go, I, I, I mean, well, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to jump in and say, uh, use the a feelings care system uh, to express all your feelings, why they shouldn't get what they want. I mean... <laughs> or how you're afraid of them getting what they want or how they're controlling you or how you can't stand them or I, I just have to say that you know Absolutely. because then that, oh, yes, sets, yes, the, yes. that yes. sets the stage for you because you you know that it, it you're not always in the place to want to have them have what they want absolutely absolutely thank you yeah. thank you I, I was <laughs> I was going and once you do what Susan has suggested and you can because it has to be genuine if you you know if you're faking it they'll know it uh, but ideally, uh, I, I think both what Susan is suggesting and also uh, having a, see if you can come with the assumption that it, there can be a solution that works for both of you. It's not at all about saying, let me help you get what you want at my expense. Yeah. Do you see? Yes. But, but the more they can feel that you care about, how, about their success, the more they're going to be willing to look at the possibility of your success. Yes, and John, John's been teaching me so much about this, and I've been applying it with neighbors and in different situations where before I had these neighbors where I just decided they wanted me to trim these trees, and, and they just I just wanted to get rid of them. And John was able to help me see how, it, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I was able to say and see that I wasn't helping them get what they wanted. All I thought about was protecting them from trying to take something away from me. And so they felt this blocking energy. And then they reacted that way to me and said things that were blocking in return. And so it was kind of, it wasn't bad, but it was just kind of a blocky kind of thing. When now they're sending wonderful emails and they're coming, the tree trimming is happening in a few days. And um, it, it's all you know, smooth sailing from finding a joyful solution that works for everybody and not just me and not just them. Yes, Edward, did you have another one? We have many. Um, here, I have two more. Uh, one from, I believe it's Stevan, Stevan, I'm not sure. How do you take care of yourself within a loving and intimate relationship? Uh, the same way you always take care of yourself. 
it, it doesn't change. I mean, there, there are some pressures once you are in an inter uh, or you felt pressures. There don't have to be pressures. But if ideally, the, the best relationships are ones where you're already taking care of yourself. If you go into a relationship saying, I need someone to complete me, then you have two half completed, you, like attracts like, you know, law of attraction. You have two half completed people trying to hang on to each other and staying above water. And that, that can make for a very uh, uncomfortable relationship. Uh, so it's, it's uh, 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 without having more specifics about what might be pulling on this particular yeah. question. And, I don't and, know. and more time. And more time, yeah. So should we take one more and then wrap up with everyone? Yes. Um, this is from our friend, Joshua Home Edward. Oh! Um, uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, John and Susan, what do you two love the most about each other in this moment? Oh. <laughs> Very nice. Wow. Uh, well, the truth is, they're, they're, uh, it's, it's constant. Uh, it's amazing. Um, the feeling. Uh, I don't know if I have time for this, but the... the, the, the <laughs> Edwards is saying not too much time. Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you can talk about your love for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, a, a little background here. The feel. The, uh, um, in any relationship, there are highs and lows, uh, but what, what makes a relationship really um, powerful is the constant feeling that one has around one's partner. And people who've been in relationships for a long time will understand this. You know, oh yeah, there are highs and lows, but it's, and, and that's interestingly enough what drew me to Susan. I had... Uh, I knew I wanted to be in a relationship again. I, 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 uh, I knew that uh, both Jeannie, I still think of her as being alive in my life, uh, wanted me to mo go on, it was delighted in that. I knew that she had gone on in my worldview to, uh, it was right for her what happened. Um, and, and so I had begun to look uh, to see, uh, you know, who I might uh, enjoy be spending time with, being with, and so on. and. What happened with me and Susan is something that happened with no other person that I had uh, contact with. Uh, after we played the transformation game, we were walking around the, the promenade deck, a group of us, and I suddenly realized um, that I felt about Susan the same feeling that I had had about Jeannie, that same comfort, that same alignment. Um, and it was really powerful, and, and that was it. That trumped everything for me. At that moment, I knew that I wanted to explore a relationship with Susan. I had, did, hardly knew anything about her. I mean, we played this game. I know she was an author. I didn't know if she'd written whodunits or whatever. Uh, but, but it was that feeling, and, and that feeling has continued. Uh, and that, that really is the most powerful thing. Yeah. yeah. So I would add that, that uh, just that, and Joshua, thank you for asking that. And it's just so beautiful. Um, just an ever present, uh, there's a feeling of peace that I have with John. There's a feeling of peace and ease. You know, I talk about, I call it the marvelous, messy middle. Um, it's, it's the place in the middle, you know, out of the extremes where there's, it's all the feelings are there. Um, but I feel a restful, I feel very restful. I feel Edward's saying to me often now, you look like you've had 70 massages. <laughs> Because um, I do feel adored, and I found out that I was also qualified to adore him. So I feel like in this moment, I'm having that right now. I mean, we're on this video in my living room, and John's wearing one of my favorite shirts. And uh, I, I'm just amazed. I'm astounded by love. I'm astounded by love. And astounded by the love reflected uh, by John and through me and by me and you know I live as much as I can like a full cup of self-love uh, sharing the overflow and you're part of now that filling and that overflow and then when I'm ha half empty which is just about every day I fill myself back up and sometimes you help and often I do that work you know I'm committed to that work whether John is here or not but having him here um, is a miracle. <laughs> it's just a miracle. And, and I would like to add, uh, uh, and it feels that way for me too, uh, the, this is the perfect path, it feels to me, for us right now. 
and I want to be clear, it's not the perfect path for everyone. Uh, there were times that I was single also, and that was the perfect path for me at that time. Uh, and there are different kinds of relationships. You know, this is the one that fits us. Uh, we're not trying to suggest yeah. a cookie cutter, but this this is this is right for us. And what, what what I can say with certainty is, you can if you use the basic principles that we're talking about, you can find the right relationship for you, even if it doesn't look on the outside like what we are doing. Yeah.